So let's pick up on putting energy into a system. So I have some sort of material right here in some state of matter. And right now we'll just talk about uh, gases, liquids, and solids. And I can put energy in or take it out. I can light a fire under it or stick it in the freezer, for example. So we've talked about the change in length, we've talked about the change in temperature by putting energy in or taking energy out. Uh, so now let's talk about change of phase. Because obviously if you take uh, an ice cube and you put it in this room, it will melt. So let's talk a little bit like that about that. So first let's get some language down. So gas, liquid, solid. So when something goes from solid phase to liquid phase, what is that called? Melting. Yes. And from liquid phase to solid phase? We're on a roll. Liquid to gas? Uh, technically, vaporization. And I'll talk a little bit why I corrected evaporation in, in a moment. Gas to liquid? Condensation? Yep. Solid to gas? Evaporation. Indeed. Gas to solid? What is the one side that goes from a solid to a gas? Solid to gas, sublimation. The other one, deposition. So sublimation, uh, what's, what's the classic example that I would say probably in your experience, life experience of sublimation? It's like dry ice, dry ice. Oh, yeah, I wasn't thinking of that one, but yeah, dry ice would do it. But also snow in general. Even though you, when, it, when it snows here, yes, some of it does melt and then will vaporize uh, or evaporate and but some will just go straight from solid into gas the sublimation there was a video i saw a couple years ago someone was trying to push this idea that snow really isn't water that it's some dangerous chemical and the example was they took a blowtorch to some snow and there wasn't much of a puddle of water to which someone, of course, very respectfully said, no, that's called sublimation. You know, I'm joking, it's the internet. It was an example of sublimation. Let's talk a little bit about evaporation versus boiling. So vaporization is the process that's going on, and there's basically two ways that it can happen. It, vaporization can happen through evaporation or boiling. And there are some differences between it, even though occasionally, just out of habit, I might use these terms somewhat interchangeably. I really shouldn't. Boiling is temperature dependent. And you can boil water that's, if I've got a pot of water, I can boil water down at the, the, the base of it. So basically it can happen anywhere inside the, the liquid. And if you put a, a, I guess you could see it on uh, non-glass pots, but glass pots work the best. Uh, in order to see it, you see that the bubbles do form at the bottom and then they work their way up. So the boiling starts down at the base in that particular case. You can get boiling in other situations where it's not just starting at the bottom, but it, there are times where you stick water into the microwave and it doesn't quite boil, but as soon as you take it out and jiggle it just a little bit, you get this big eruption of bubbles coming out and that's called superheated liquid. And if you experience the, the microwave bit, Okay, one of you, you just don't microwave that much? And then evaporation happens, one, it's not temperature dependent. Uh, that's probably not the best wording there. It can happen at most temperatures and at the surface. You just happen to have a molecule that hits the right speed so that it can escape. But some of these terms are sort of thrown about almost interchangeably. Just, just be aware that some are very specific in the language. So when I put energy into a system, I can change the temperature, or if I am at some certain critical temperatures, I can actually change the phase. So as I put energy into this system, as I, if, so if I have energy going in, so heat going in, unless I'm at one of those transition points, I will, basically the energy goes into the kinetic energy of the atoms, 
or molecules, and they'll start moving around faster and faster. At some point, they will start to separate. That's when you get the change of phase. That's when the energy doesn't go into the kinetic energy, but goes into the potential energy. So change in phase corresponds to a change in potential energy. Whereas change in temperature corresponds with change in kinetic energy. One of the key things here, notice that I made a distinction between change in phase and change in temperature. So when I'm going through a change in phase, there's no change in temperature. In reality, I got a pot of water, I'm putting energy into it. As it starts to go turn into the gas phase, that some will be turning into a gas phase while other water is changing in temperature. And so both things will be happening sim simultaneously, just not to the, the basically the same molecule in a sense. And then in order to change phase, there of course is a formula. I know that if I'm dealing with this right here, that Q is equal to MC delta T. This is something that you worked with last week and potentially some this week. But for a change in phase, since there is no change in temperature, we need something a little bit different. We have these extra subscripts here. So the C in this formula from last week, this is the specific heat. This C right here is the heat of vaporization. And this one is the heat of fusion. I do latent, sorry, latent heat of vaporization, latent heat of fusion. Now, fusion is when you bring things together. Basically, you fuse them in a sense, same, same root. So fusion happens here when things are being turned in from liquid to solid or from solid to liquid, depending on if you're putting energy in or taking energy out. It's still called heat of, latent heat of fusion, even though you're fusing one direction and you're defusing the other direction. And heat of vaporization works for both of these, even though one case you're actually vaporizing, the other case you're condensing. There is a latent heat for the side that I have not done, but it's just the sum of the other two. To give you some idea of numbers here, so for the latent heat of fusion for water, 79.7 .7 calories per gram. And vaporization, latent heat of vaporization for water, 597.3 calories per gram. I'm not expecting you to memorize those numbers, but just have some idea of what is a reasonable number here. The top one up here translates into 330,000 joules per kilogram, or 330 joules per gram. And then this would translate into 2,500,000 joules per kilogram, or 2,500 joules per gram. So let's run through an example. I'm going to take water. And just so that the numbers match what I are in my notes. Negative 10 to 115. All right. Going from negative 10 degrees Celsius to 115 degrees Celsius. The question is, how much energy is required? So we set up a little chart here just to sort of give some sense of where we are in this, because we have to break it up into five different parts. So the temperature in degrees Celsius here, so this is negative 10. So what point, it starts out at negative 10 degrees Celsius, we assume standard atmospheric pressure. At what point is it going to change phase? At what temperature? Zero. Yes. So from negative 10 to zero, the energy that I put into it is gonna cause change in temperature until I get to zero. And then, I'm going to put energy into it, which is going to cause a change in phase, so my temperature doesn't change. So once, I, once it changes phase, once I've melted the whole thing, then the energy goes into it in order to change the temperature. And what's the next temperature in which I'm going to change phase? 
And then at that point, I'm going to boil it. And then the problem ends at 115. So in order to figure out how much energy is required to take this water from negative 10 degrees Celsius up to 115 degrees Celsius, first thing we need to do, we're going to call this part one, we need to figure out how much energy does it take to get it up to the freezing point or melting point. And then how much energy is required in order to melt it, how much energy is required in order to get it up to the boiling point, how much energy is required to boil it and then how much energy is required in order to get it up to that final temperature. So parts one, three, and five, we've done, that's what we did last week. Part two and four, that's new. So for one, three, and five, we're gonna use the Q equals MC delta T for part two. And we're using Q is equal to MC F. And for part four, Q equals MC U. Part one, is that the, the change from negative 10 to zero? Yes. Okay. Can you do the math of the one? Yes. Make 25 grams. So about 25 milliliters of water, so if I had a tube about that yay big around, it would be about, uh, about that deep. Equivalent of about two or three ice cubes from a standard ice cube tray. We're going to be taking ice from negative 10 up to zero degrees Celsius. And so I have my mass, 25 grams times the specific heat of ice. It is not the same as water. Specific heat of ice is 2.05 joules per gram. Times, what is my change in temperature? Just for this one phase right here. Oops, sorry, that's joules per gram degree Celsius left off part of the unit there from the specific heat of ice. And then it's just a matter of multiplying. But we joules. Because the way the unit I have for specific heat has joules in it. The grams will cancel out, degrees Celsius will cancel out. I'm left with joules. Phase two. The part where all I'm doing is melting the ice. So I'm dealing with this formula right here. Mass times the latent heat of fusion. So it's 25 grams times 330 joules per gram. So it takes significantly more energy to melt it than it does to raise the temperature. Phase three, we're changing temperature here. And so we're back to MC delta T. So I have 25 grams times the specific heat of water. Now, specific heat of water does change depending upon where you are, and so uh, we can go for just a, sort of a generic value. Uh, the number that I have written down in my notes here is 4.1813. You'll see other variations, things that are about that. Uh, joules per gram, degrees Celsius, times, what's my change in temperature? Ten thousand four hundred fifty-three. So, given our mass of water, there it takes about a quarter more energy to get it from freezing to boiling than it does just to melt it, or I guess zero degrees liquid to hundred degrees liquid. So, twenty-five grams. I'm blatant heat of vaporization. 
most amount of energy there so far. And then the last little bit, we're taking our, we've, at this point, we've boiled the water, turned it into steam, and so now we're going to raise the temperature of that specific heat of steam. This is very similar to ice, 2.08. Joules per gram degree Celsius times, at this point we're at 100 degrees Celsius, we need to raise it just to 15 degrees. 700. So that's the amount of energy it requires to put into this, into this bit of water in order to get it from negative 10 degrees Celsius to 115 degrees Celsius, and therefore the total energy is 2,495.75. 2,495. 2,495.75. Recognize that. Let's concentrate on this, just this one bit right here. The amount of energy required to melt something. So if I put an ice cube, if I put that, well, it probably hurt at some point because it's I'm picturing three three normal size ice cubes, but if I put three normal size ice cubes into my mouth, it will melt. Where does that energy come from? Yeah. So let's translate that into calories. The conversion from joules to calories is 4.18, so multiply times 4.184 joules per calorie. 1971.8. All right, calories, with a lowercase c, which converting to food calories, 1.9718 food calories. Why is the specific heat different for part three? I, I didn't understand that. Specific heat is dependent upon temperature and phase. So specific heat for liquid water is different than it, it is for ice than it is for oh. steam.